This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From custom domains to beautiful websites using their easily customizable templates that you can have up and running in minutes, e-commerce, email and email marketing, SEO, analytics, and scheduling, Squarespace does it all and has done it for us for the last six years. If you are a small to mid-sized business in any industry, Squarespace is the place to go for all of your website needs. Hop over to www.squarespace.com slash you for a free trial. And if you like what you see and want to move forward, receive 10% off your first order by using the discount code Hugh at checkout. Thanks, Squarespace. This is Leica's SL2 and Aposumicron SL35 F2. It is Leica's flagship full-frame camera, a $6,600, 47-megapixel beast stills or video Unmatched for build quality, weather sealing, industrial design, and joy for me in hand. With the $5,200 Apo 35, it is not only a pinnacle instrument, but a personal companion in my photographic journey. Now, this is Claudia's Leica CL with the Sumalux TL35 1.4. It is Leica's completely misunderstood and underappreciated homage to the Leica 2, a $3,200, 24-megapixel APS-C rangefinder-style camera with exceptional build qualities, ergos, and extraordinary dedicated crop coverage lens line. At just over six large for this particular combination, you've got a killer street photography kit with glass so good it handily outperforms the sensor's resolution. Hold that thought. But then there's this. Nikon's deceptive, terribly underrated, $3,000, 45 megapixel, full frame Z7 II with brilliant, no optical compromise, Nikkor Z 50 millimeter 1.8 S, a $600 lens, $600 lens that absolutely and incredibly gives up just about nothing optically to Leica's Aposumicron SL50, or, for that matter, a Zeiss Otis. Now, we've been shooting on and off with it over the last few months, Claudia especially using the outstanding Nikkor Z24-70 2.8, and straight up, if we weren't already invested in Leica, if I didn't have a personal connection with the Leica brand going back to my childhood. At less than one-third the price of my SL2 kit, about half the price of Claudia's CL kit, we'd both be shooting with the Z7 too. Seriously. Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. I've already delivered the punchline, so I'll keep the rest of this as brief as I can, beginning with the most obvious. First, right, no newsflash. I've just shared with you a subjective assessment based upon our use cases and our priorities. The primary use case for our Leicas is street photography. Our highest priorities are image quality, handling, size, weight, the lack of futzing, heritage, and joy. In the process, we've come to embrace high-resolution full-frame sensors as the Goldilocks format for our street work. It allows us to reduce the number of lenses we carry because we can crop the crap out of images and 
We are printing larger and viewing images more closely, that is, at closer distances, than we ever have. On the other hand, we use a completely different system for our professional video work. The choice, however, is as much a function of the state of mind I want to be in when I shoot on the street and how I want to interact with my camera as it is the SL2's recording limit and middling video autofocus performance, both of which, and this is important, are material deficiencies given our specific and new video use cases, which is why I'm recording this right now on our Sony A7S III rather than this guy, the Z62. Those use cases are one, one-on-one -on -one real time video mentoring, two, real time zoom presentations, and three, whack a mole product showcase shots, all the results of the shift in our various revenue streams brought on by the pandemic. Until these use cases, we'd used our GH5 as our daily driver for years, brilliant in pretty much all ways, save for this particular level of autofocus performance. Oh well. Second, if we hadn't embraced sensor resolution over more glass and had insisted on a single system to do it all, we'd probably have put Fujifilm at the top of the list. The, where is it? Uh, here, X-T4. Does it all, stills and video, with fewer hybrid operating deficiencies than our Leicas or the Nikon Z7 II and Z6 II, but a high-resolution APS-C sensor, say 40 megapixels or more, isn't on the immediate horizon. At least, I don't think it is. On the other hand, the image quality coming from this bad boy, Fujifilm's GFX100, is the best I've ever seen. Their GF Glass Superb, and it does record 4K beautifully. But for street photography and all day carry, the system is bigger and heavier than I want. I prefer my SL2. While for video, the autofocus, though hybrid phase detect, still needs a number of iterations, I think, before it's bulletproof. Which is why, again, we have an A7S III. Put differently, what I've learned shooting all of these cameras and many more, some of which I'll share with you a little bit later in the video, is that full frame is the sweet spot for what we shoot, how we shoot, how we process in post, and how much weight we're willing to carry, though who knows what a, like a CL2, if they ever make one, or a Fujifilm X-H2, an X-T5, could be. Third, right. Like every camera ever made, the Nikons clearly have their weaknesses and other camera systems are better for certain use cases. It's not like the Z7 II or Z6 II, now that they've got dual card slots and dual processors, are suddenly the last cameras I'll ever look at. The fact is, you can get better autofocus, wider lens selection, superior video capability, and even greater resolution, sensor and EVF, by going Sony. But you'll have to pay more if you want it all. $800 more for the 61 megapixel 5.7 million dot EVF A7R4A with, say, the Zeiss 55 1.8, $4,400 all in, versus $3,600 for the Z7 II and Z51.8 S though the Sony setup will be 84 grams lighter, a function of the 55's tiny 281 grams, which is a feat unto itself. Then again, you could substitute a 42 megapixel A7R3A for the R4A, and then bundled with the Zeiss 55 1.8, you'd actually pay $400 less than for the Z7 II kit. Now, personally, I prefer the Z7-2's menu system, ergos, handling, IBIS, and build quality, touch interface, and brilliant as the Zeiss 55 is, it breathes like a dragon, while the Nikkor Z51.8 breathes like a Cinelens. Which is to say, basically, not at all at the distances I've used it. Which, yeah, doesn't matter at all for stills, and that's really what we're talking about, but it matters a whole bunch for video, which is perhaps my biggest frustration with this second generation of Zs.
because we at Three Blind Men and an Elephant clearly do have significant video needs. Now, this is what happens using the A7S III with Sony's new $600 50mm f2.5, a very sharp and tasty, very light, fast and silent, auto-focusing, accessibly priced optic, but it also suffers from what I consider to be monstrous focus breathing. See what I mean? Compare that to the new Nikkor Z51.8 on the Z62, when the autofocus works, and it does work better than the original, and the difference in focus breathing to my eye is significant. Alternatively, you can get better autofocus, superior IBIS, wider lens selection, especially at the long end, superior video capabilities, superior touchscreen implementation, although now that I think about it, you can get as much as you want at the long end with Sony too, full flippy screen, and in the case of the R5 superior EVF from Canon's latest R5 and R6. But again, you'll have to pay more than you would for the comparable Nikon kit. In this case, a whole lot more. Forget the RF 51.8, because it's simply not in the same league as the Z 51.8S. You'll have to pony up instead for the RF 51.2, which is a lovely lens, but now with the R5, you're talking 6200 bucks for the Canon kit, which is $2,600 more dear and a whopping 574 grams heavier than the Z 72 combo. That is the choice the Canon gives you. I'd forget about the new Nikkor Z51.2 S. Great lens from all accounts, but I much prefer the smaller, lighter, faster, and way cheaper 1.8 Z. Though, if you wanted the Nikon Z51.2 S, the Nikon kit would still be $900 less expensive than the Canon. Plug in the R6 instead and compare it to the Z62, and we're talking a $2,200 premium over the Z62 kit, and a weight penalty of still more than half a kilo. No thank you. Even if, absolutely, the RF50 1.2 wide open is dreamy creamy. I might feel differently if Canon had chosen the same lens strategy as Nikon. That is, no optical compromise, but accessibly priced, moderately fast primes. But they didn't opting instead for heavy, expensive Halo products like the 51.2 and that 28-70 to 2.0 non-image stabilized, at least at launch. Oh well. What about the most obvious Leica proxy of all? What about their L-mount cousins, the Panasonic Lumix S1R, S1, S1H, or S5? After all, I have it here, this guy, the 41 megapixel S1R closes in on half the price of the SL2. The 24 megapixel SL1 is almost exactly half the price of the SL2S, the S5, well under half the price of the SL2S, and astoundingly quite close to the SL2S in terms of performance, if not in pedigree, build quality, or industrial design. The S1H it's over there, I'm not getting it, is a more specialized camera, a 24 megapixel 6K recording, Netflix approved video centric hybrid. So if that's what you need, that's where you want to go. Yes, the $4,000 S1H stands alone. Across the board, it is fair to say, I think, that the panties are not only less expensive, but they are more buttoned up than the Leicas, beginning with Real-time depth of field preview. I can't believe I'm still talking about this. I can't believe that Leica SL2 series and the CL don't do that still. So credit where credit is due. Panasonic's full-frame camera lineup, again, I think, is the most thoroughly conceived and executed out there, bar none, save for video autofocus or 10 tenths still focus for sports and wildlife. Other than the S5, the Nikons are significantly smaller, lighter, less expensive, with better autofocus, and I keep saying it, the best 1.8 primes on the market at the price, which I think makes them better Leica substitutes than the panties. 
I am really looking forward to Panasonic delivering the full complement of 1.8 primes in their lens roadmap, but who knows when that will come. For now, Nikon's 1.8 primes stand alone. I haven't really talked about Fujifilm, so let's touch on that briefly, because you can get the same kind of rangefinder-inspired styling of the CL, but with superior autofocus performance, marginally higher resolution, far superior video capability and connectivity, an articulating screen, and access to some wonderful glass by embracing Fujifilm's 26.2 megapixel APS-C X-Pro3 for a lot less money. To keep it comparable, even though the 16 1.4 and 56 1.2 are my go-tos, let's mate it to the XF35 1.4. Now you're talking $2,600 all in, which is less than half the price of the CL with the Sumalux TL35 1.4. The real kick in the head? You could substitute the $850 XC4 for the X-Pro3 or the video-centric IBIS-equipped XS10 for $150 more with the same sensor and processor. And at that point, you'd be paying $1,450 or $1,600 respectively, more like one quarter the price of the CL kit. Though frankly, and this is what most people don't understand, the Sumalux TL, that TL lens line, blows the XF lens line out of the water. They're incredible. The full-frame Nikon Z5 with that gonzo great 51.8s by the way would split the baby at around 1900 bucks just saying i'll sum it up this way we love our leicas they are a source of joy and inspiration they are talismans they are photographic companions and the image quality is spectacular but other than my SL2, Nikon's 47 megapixel Z7 II in particular, with Nikon's Nikkor Z1.8 primes for me, and their Z24 to 72.8 zoom for Claudia, which I think is among the top three, irrespective of mount, aligns more closely with the use cases and priorities of our personal work than any other camera out there, including for the first time the Leica CL. It does so at a fraction of the price of the CL and SL2, and in some ways, beats both of them. If we didn't have the wherewithal to invest in Leica for our personal work, we'd invest in Nikon. This is not the case for our professional video work, as I said, to my chagrin, which is why we chose after four glorious years with our GH5 and then a sudden change in our video priorities to switch to Sony's A7S III, which is not perfect either. Don't let anyone tell you it is. Though, by the way, we didn't get to the A7S III before flirting very seriously with Fujifilm's XC4, XS10, and, for a very brief moment, Canon's R6. If the Z6 II had the autofocus performance, heat management, and absence of recording limit that are hallmarks of the A7S III, those Nikkor primes would be enough to make us standardize on Nikon across our personal and professional work. But it doesn't. I don't know when it will. And we do have the wherewithal to invest in Leica and the L-Mount Alliance. I own and am delighted by Sigma's 24 3.5, 35F2, 45 2.8, 65F2, and 85 1.4. Still, unless there's a high-resolution CL2 with improved EVF and weather sealing just over the horizon, or a high-resolution full-frame Panasonic with highly performant hybrid phase-detect autofocus, I think we're about to get Claudia a Z7 II with Nikkor Z24 to 72.8 anyway. I did not see that coming. This episode was brought to you by Squarespace. For all of your website needs, Squarespace is the place to go. Hop over to www.squarespace.com slash you for a free trial. And if you like what you see and want to move forward, receive 10% off your first order by using the discount code Hugh at checkout. Thanks, Squarespace. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below because this is an incredible audience. If you'd like a copy of our Streets of New York, the book, head over to www.3bmep.com slash books. If you'd like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one video session with me for a portfolio review, explore or hone your artistic voice, select gear and more, sign up at www.3bmep.com slash booking. Finally, consider supporting our work by using our no-cost-to-you affiliate links down below. 
picking up some official three blind men and an elephant swag at 3bmep.threadless.com, sending coffee money via PayPal, or best of all, join us as a patron over at Patreon. However you choose to support us, as always, we thank you for it. <laughs>